We're now going to read the Jesuit oath to gain an insight into exactly how they went about trying to destroy the work of the Reformation. When I warned that we'd be going into some twisted and disturbing stuff, this is one of the things I had in mind. It's an extremely disturbing document, but it's important to go over it, as it doesn't just give us insight into the Jesuits. By proxy, it gives us deep insight into the mind of our demonic enemy as a whole, and the tactics that Satan may still employ today against us. Remember, he has no new tricks. Incidentally, I'll post a copy of this in the notes section of the Fuel Project Facebook page if you want to read it again. My son, you have been taught to act the dissembler, amongst the Roman Catholics to be a Roman Catholic, and to be a spy even among your own brethren, to believe no man, to trust no man, among the reformers to be a reformer, among the Huguenots to be a Huguenot, among the Calvinists to be a Calvinist, among the Protestants, generally to be a Protestant, and obtaining their confidence to seek even to speak from their pulpits, and to denounce with all vehemence in your nature our holy religion and the Pope, and even to descend so low as to become a Jew amongst the Jews, that you might be enabled to gather together all information for the benefit of your order as a faithful soldier of the Pope. You have been taught to insidiously plant the seeds of jealousy and hatred between states that were at peace and incite them to deeds of blood involving them in war with each other, and to create revolutions and civil wars in communities, provinces and countries that were independent and prosperous, cultivating the arts and the sciences, and enjoying the blessings of peace. To take sides with the combatants, and to act secretly in concert with your brother Jesuit, who might be engaged on the other side, but openly opposed to that which you might be connected, only that the church might be the gainer in the end, in the conditions fixed in the treaties for peace, and that in the end justifies the means. You have been taught your duties as a spy to gather all statistics, facts and information in your power from every source, to ingratiate yourself into the confidence of the family circle of Protestants and heretics of every class and character, as well as that of the merchant, the banker, the lawyer, amongst the schools and universities, in parliament and legislatures, and in the judiciaries and councils of state, and to be all things to all men for the Pope's sake, whose servants we are unto death. You have received all your instructions heretofore as a novice, a neophyte, and have served as a coadjutor, confessor and priest, but you have not yet been invested with all that is necessary to command in the army of Loyola in the service of the Pope. You must serve the proper time as the instrument and executioner as directed by your superiors, for none can command here who has not consecrated his labours with the blood of the heretic, for without the shedding of blood no man can be saved. Therefore, to fit yourself for your work and make your own salvation sure, you will, in addition to your former oath of obedience to your order and allegiance to the Pope, repeat after me. I promise that and declare that I will, when opportunity presents, make and wage relentless war, secretly or openly, against all Protestants and Liberals as I am directed to do, to extirpate and exterminate them from the face of the whole earth, and that I will spare neither age, sex or condition, and that I will hang, burn, waste, boil, flay, strangle and bury alive these infamous heretics, rip up the stomachs and wombs of their women and crush their infants' heads against the walls in order to annihilate forever their execrable race. That when the same cannot be done openly, I will secretly use the poisoned cup, the strangulating cord, the steel of the poniard or the leaden bullet, regardless of the honour, rank, dignity or authority of the person or persons, whatever may be their condition in life, either public or private, as I at any time may be directed to do so by any agent of the Pope or superior of the Brotherhood of the Holy Faith, the Society of Jesus. By reading these words we gain a full appreciation of their shocking tactics, which can be summed up like this. Their intention was to become part of the faith, system, culture or group that they intended to destroy. Then from within they would sow seeds of hate and division. Their method was to present themselves as one thing on the surface, but to be secretly working away with each other for a very different purpose behind the scenes. They would sometimes pretend to be enemies on opposing sides in public, but behind the scenes they were actually cohorts, working together towards the same goal. This type of attack is sometimes referred to as becoming a fifth column, meaning that the most effective way to attack something is not from the north or the south or the east or the west, but from within. Cicero once said, 
A nation can survive its fools and even the ambitious, but it cannot survive treason from within. An enemy at the gates is less formidable, for he is known and he carries his banners openly. But the traitor moves among those within the gates freely, his sly whispers rustling through all the alleys, heard in the very halls of government itself. For the traitor appears not traitor, he speaks in the accents familiar to his victims, and he wears their face and their garments, and he appeals to the baseness that lies deep in the hearts of all men. He rots the soul of a nation, he works secretly and unknown in the night to undermine the pillars of a city, he infects the body politic so that it can no longer resist, a murderer is less to be feared. The fifth column tactic is of course a trademark of Satan. It was the very tactic he used to persuade a third of the angels to fall with him and to become his army of demons. He went around whispering in the ears of anyone who would listen to turn them against God. More recently, ex-witches have spoken of being assigned to local churches by their coven with the aim of being involved in the congregation on the surface, but all the while secretly working against it from within, frustrating its aims and unity. If something is attacked from without, it will put up its defences and fight back, but if, by using deceit, the attacker can become part of the thing it wishes to destroy and gains the trust of those involved, they can take it down from within. But could we really expect any human being to carry out the acts described in this monstrous Jesuit oath? Well, remember that the spiritual exercises were designed to eliminate all human emotion and to turn the men into machines. And just as demonic influence was so clearly at work in Loyola's cave experience, so they are involved in the spiritual exercises. H. Bomer in Les Jesuits writes, We imbue unto him spiritual forces which he would find very difficult to eliminate later. These forces can come up again to the surface, sometimes after years of not even mentioning them, and become so imperative that the will finds itself unable to oppose any obstacle and has to follow their irresistible impulse. In other words, through the spiritual exercises, the Jesuit initiate becomes possessed and finds themselves compelled to act according to the will of these demonic forces within. Because Jesuit actions are centred on blind obedience to their superiors, they are told that they will never be held accountable for anything they do, not even by God. They are absolved of all personal responsibility as they become mere puppets for those that are higher up in the hierarchy. A professor told a student who was studying under him to become a Catholic priest, You will never have to give an account to God for actions you do by the order of your legitimate superiors. If they were to deceive you, being themselves deceived, they alone would be responsible for the error you have committed. Your sin would be imputed to you as long as you follow the golden rule that is a base for all Christian philosophy and perfection, humility and obedience. See how deceitful this is. The superiors are basically saying, you'll never have to give an account of your actions to God, don't worry about it. This allows them to perpetrate any act in the belief that they are beyond judgment. If their superior tells them to carry out a murder, they think that if they obey, then God will not hold them accountable and will instead blame the superior. This is one method the hierarchy uses to overcome or bypass the conscience of an individual. When you combine this with the spiritual exercises that have taught them to suppress human emotion and imbued them with demons, you can see how they would become capable of some extreme acts of violence and anything else for that matter. A second vital principle for Jesuits can be summed up in the phrase, the end justifies the means. Remember this one, it's very important. Before this maxim, the ideas of absolute right and wrong completely vanish. Conceivably, there is no crime or atrocity that is not allowed as long as it is for the greater glory of God. In fact, the sins that achieve the right results become holy in the eyes of the Jesuit, no matter how disgusting. You can lie, cheat, steal, rape or murder, but if the ends are the right ones in their eyes, then the means are justified. This exact concept also exists in Islam, where lying, deception, murder and other atrocities become acceptable if it furthers the cause of Allah on the earth. A third twisted principle of the Jesuits is probabilism. If a Jesuit has in mind to do something but knows it is very probably illegal, 
If he can find the merest hint that it may not be, he is allowed to continue with his action. For example, if he consults 100 teachers or doctors about his intended action and 99 say that it would be unlawful, but then one tells him that it may not be, he can act on that 1% probability that it is in fact lawful. In fact, if the Jesuit can imagine any reason in his own mind why his action may not be unlawful, however unlikely, this frees him to do it. It's a form of self-deception, lying to yourself to try to keep the conscience clear. Fourthly, there is the idea of directing the intention. This is the idea that if the person meditates on something holy while they perpetrate something evil, the soul contracts no guilt or stain. Therefore the Jesuit can kill someone or lie or cheat or steal, but as long as he is focusing on something holy at the time in his mind, their soul remains white as snow. Again, such is the depth of deceit within the Jesuit system that they deceive even themselves. Fifthly and finally, there is the doctrine of equivocation or mental reservation. This policy allows the Jesuits to follow a secret policy while stating something completely different to the outside world. This is directly from the mysteries where secret doctrines and purposes were hidden under double meanings and secret symbols that seem quite innocent to the uninitiated. A Jesuit quoted, It is permitted to use ambiguous terms, leading people to understand them in a different sense from that in which we understand them. A man may swear that he never did something, though he actually did, meaning within himself that he did not do so on such a day, or before he was born, or under any circumstances, while the words he employs may have no such sense as we discover his meaning. He goes on to say, It is the intention that determines the quality of the action, and one may avoid falsehood if, after saying or denying something aloud, then add something under his breath that, if true, would make his statement the truth. So take this example, a Jesuit murders a man on a Thursday and the police take him in for questioning and ask him if he murdered the man in question. The Jesuit replies, I did not murder him, which is obviously a lie because he did, but then under his breath or mentally he adds the words, on Friday. These inaudible words that he whispered to himself after the initial lie have now made the statement true. By doing this, Jesuits can permit perjury and in their own eyes remain blameless.